accept it and then we can continue. Okay, uh, so my name is Alexander Ercek. I'll be here as a technical support if anything happens. I'm here, but uh, the Doug today, Doug is today our chairperson and uh, leader of the meeting. So, Doug, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for all of your help, and and again, wonderful to see everybody here online, uh, friends from friends from the world, and and much much appreciated. Um, I'll share. I'm going to share my screen here. And, and introduce uh, our session here today with a few slides. A little bit of luck. And um, there we go. Everybody can see that? Still hear me? Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay, yes. good. Well, yeah. well, you know, um, Australia is unique in many ways. And, and um, and in some sense, I'm the kind of the new kid on the block compared to some of the people who are on our panel here today, especially. And, and uh, but it, it, it always amazes me because, uh, you know, we're an island with no neighbor countries, but we're also a continent. Uh, some say the oldest exposed part of the earth, rich in resources and variety. Uh, we had a big kangaroo in our backyard yesterday. You won't find that anyplace else in the world. Um, but we only have a population of 25 million. Uh, with a land mass larger than all of Europe. And you can see that down in those slides on the bottom. Uh, and so that makes it, again, very special and very unique. Uh, so uh, even though this part of our population goes back to an indigenous population for over 60,000 years, um, the, Brit the British penal colony was <laughs> established in 1788. And that was kind of the first European presence, if you will. Uh, and and still is the dominant population. I mean, the indigenous population is a few percent. So, in but we also have people from all over the world, um, Asian, um, you know, clearly. So, but Australia ultimately is is by some measure the most ethnically uh, diverse country in the world. So so we're unique. We're unique in many ways. Um, Australia has a digital technology task force, which in all honesty, I didn't know until a couple of weeks ago, uh, that talks about towards 2030 and positioning Australia as a leading digital economy and society in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, includes considering how the government can promote productivity gains through the uptake of digital technology across the Australian economy. But I didn't find anything in there personally that reflected the value of seniors and, and what seniors can provide and the sensitivity towards seniors as, as, a, as a resource. And so that's still work in progress. Um, but the other thing <clears throat> that's still involved with us and more on more recently, of course, is this Bletchley Declaration and, and the whole thoughts and thinking about an understanding of the opportunities and risks Posed by, by frontier artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence. And this, by the way, was signed by the US, EU, and China, but also Australia. So Australia is right in this mix. Uh, major vendors were present there in the UK, and uh, each with their own vested interests, of course. <clears throat> and, you know, definitely in a consensus on the need for sustained international cooperation. So this is going to bring in a whole set of issues that give seniors an, an opportunity to consider and, and think about and, and be recognized as, as, a, as a part of what goes on in this space. Um, there was an interesting cartoon in The, in the econ Economist uh, with starting the UK, U, EU, China, and US saying, we declare that AI poses a potentially catastrophic risk to humankind. And across the bottom, it says, and I cannot wait uh, to be first, you know. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of global competition uh, as we get into that, but a lot of opportunity for the wisdom, frankly, that can come from senior scholars. Um, I go back with AI for over 50 years, and I remember a thing called Eliza, which was a quote, "amazing artificial intelligence simulation." Well, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> Eliza really never took hold. And, and so we always have to be sensitive about artificial intelligence and 
it's it's had its ups and downs, uh, but maybe this time's different. Maybe this time's different. And it's something that, again, we as seniors can really reflect on and consider uh, how that might uh, blend into society. And so, yeah, this may be different. This may be different. So we may, we may have uh, generative AI as a part of our new society. We don't know yet. We'll find out. So senior academics contribute. Um, the traditional view of retired really does not fit. And you're going to hear that today from everyone. And I look forward to it hearing. I know a little bit about each what each of these uh, discussants is doing, but I don't know everything by any stretch. And <clears throat> most, most senior academics all have significant global experience. I know that from meeting them around the world. And, and some are sustaining traditional activities to some extent. Others have branched into a, a wide range of new and varied activities. And all are involved in developing, disseminating knowledge and wisdom and, and contributing to the silver economy in a, in a, in a digitized um, way. So digitized society. So all of this is front and center to certainly my heart. Um, I've historically, for, for the last 10 years, basically been the founder and director of the eHealth Research Institute uh, up in China. But that's got a focus on digital support for wellness that's, that's global. In, in scope. Uh, I'm also direct, more directly associated with the Australasian Association for Information Systems and uh, its conferences and online interactions and community outreach and scholarships, rewards, and, and uh, it's the outstanding AIS chapter for which I was a former president uh, uh, and for the last 10 years since I can remember. So, you know, we play a, we play a role in Australia globally. Uh, I'm also an Institute of Digital Health fellow, uh, and the vision here is healthier lives digitally enabled. And this is this is a, a group that's composed of of healthcare professionals from all different angles, uh, everything from clinicians uh, and surgeons to again people people like me, information systems uh, people. So conferences, webinars, Zoom bars, brekkies breakfast in Australia. Um, so it's it's interesting. It's an interesting group. I'm also active with the University of the Third Age, which I like the slogan, a university show consists of a body of persons who undertake to learn and help others to learn. Those who learn shall also teach, and those who teach shall also learn. So I, to me, that kind of epitomizes who we are. There's 300 chapters in Australian community. Uh, we're here today to learn more. This is my favorite t-shirt. If you rest, you rust. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from today's discussions, uh, Carmel and David and Helen and Heinz and Henry and Ron. So without further ado, I think I'll turn it over to you, Colin or Carmel and fill in where you wish. Mute. I remember that slide, um, Doug. We were using that 20 years ago. <laughs> of course. Um, you might like to stop sharing a screen, mate. Right? Yeah. Um, I will. I, will. I, I won't be using any slides. I'll just be talking. Um, okay. So both David and I are Australian, as you can gather from our beautiful dulcet accents. Um, and both of us were professors of higher education, um, directors of teaching and learning centres in various parts of the world. Uh, David might say a little bit about himself, but uh, I've spent 30 years outside Australia. Um, I spent 15 years in my younger, um, early career in uh, Zimbabwe and South Africa, and then I had a period in back in Australia while my kids went through uh, secondary school. And then uh, David and I went to Hong Kong for a decade. Uh, we then went to Singapore for a short time and then finally finished with a couple of years in the Middle East. So um, we've had a sort of varied and absolutely fascinating career. And it's been an absolute privilege to learn from all the different cultures and countries that we've lived and worked in. Um, so, but I'm gonna concentrate on what we do now. Um, we sort of both retired by about 2016, 
And I'm not ashamed to say we're both in our 70s now and uh, amazingly fit and healthy, which for which we're grateful. But so from about 2016 to 2020, we were what, what so many retired professors are, which is consultants. You know, in, in other words, old professors never really die. They just become consultants. And much of that work was in Africa, um, including both of us as visiting professors at the University of Johannesburg. And that was very much a blended process. So we'd go over there once or twice a year and run workshops and talk to people. But it was very much a mentoring role to help uh, early career academics establish research profiles and get themselves published. And, you know, that's a really challenging job. Um, we also worked in Ghana um, a few times uh, giving teaching and learning workshops because Ghana has no academic staff development. So uh, it was, again, it was just wonderful to be in a country where people were so keen to learn and uh, develop. So we did that for, um, and we're thinking that this is cool, we'll do this for quite some time. And then a thing called COVID came along. And so we were in South Africa working um, in early, 2020 and uh, the university closed and so we had to come home and then we decided yeah okay we're going to be retired now so that was I think um, a, quite a turning point from this uh, idea that we were still actively working with organizations that were universities so we were still working in the higher education sector so now we pardon Oh, yes, and we were still publishing. Um, and then I thought, no, there's got to be a way in which for the next whatever number of decades I have left um, that you contribute to society, but it's not necessarily at a university. Um, and so since then, um, we've involved ourselves in, in a lot of community activities. Um, uh, and the, I'm going to list uh, a few of them and talk about them, and then David will talk about a few more that he's been involved in. Um, and, and I think, I don't know whether we call these digital, but all of them involve, obviously, digital technologies. But increasingly, um, my experience and certainly the experiences we had in, in Africa are that you can work with people online once you have a relationship. But building that relationship is so much easier when you can sit down and talk and really interact. And I think um, for us, COVID has shown us that the, the value of face-to-face, free-flowing conversations, um, and, and that remains for us a sort of hallmark of any project that we get involved in, that we feel that... Uh, we really want to get to know people and work with them and not just provide information and you know support and so on. So I'm going to talk about, start with what we did today. Um, we are a member of uh, our local Neighbourhood Watch. Now, this is a community organisation in Australia that um, where we work with the local police to try and help people think about their security um, of their cars and their houses and so on. And the area we live in, in, in Melbourne has, well, uh, I suppose all areas do, has a number of elderly folk. Uh, and they tend to sort of forget to lock the door and they leave the garage door open and so on and so forth. So once a month, we get the data from the police about where, um, uh, the most burglaries are in Melbourne, in, in our area. And we live in a, a very nice area in Melbourne. Um, so, you know, things like areas that have good stuff to steal. And so we walk around the streets and we give people information and, and so on. Now, that sounds a sort of low key activity, but every time I, I go on one of these walks, I have several conversations with people, with trades guys who have left their vans open or people who are in their gardens and you just simply stop and have a conversation with them. And then you give them some information which 
points them to various websites and so on about how to avoid uh, being scammed, how to keep their security, how for, and so on. Now, it seems to us that the strengths that we bring to that process is that we're really quite comfortable about trying to establish conversations with people. So, um, and, and I think that comes from the years that we had as uh, directors of teaching and learning, where we were trying to persuade people to think about changing uh, the way in which they went about teaching. So that it's a sort of, as I said, it's a low key example, but it indicates in order to be able to do it, you, I think you need a fair bit of experience. Um, another example is there, um, I, I'm not sure about all other places, but in Melbourne, there's virtually no community newspapers left. The, you know, they've died. Um, and so um, a group um, in, in, we're in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, has set up a community newspaper called East Side of News. And again, both David and I uh, act as editors and contributors and so on. And it, it's amazing the sort of wealth of information that exists when you can help people tell their stories and help them present it. Now, it's a digital newspaper, um, but it, it really has uh, acts as a way of binding the community, a very diverse community. As uh, Doug commented, Australia is ethnically extremely diverse and the eastern suburbs of Melbourne has a very high Asian population. So allowing people for whom English is a second language to actively have a voice that uh, enables them to put their point of view is I think a really important thing. Um, on a really local example, um, we, we live, and I'm just looking out the window at the moment, it's just about to get to sunset here in Melbourne. Um, and I can see almost nothing but trees. It, it is a, a beautiful area with lots and lots of parks. And one of the, the ways in which uh, experienced people can provide support to the community is to actually look at the uh, policies and strategies that our local municipalities have about you know, parks and uh, regulations for um, cycle tracks and all the rest of it, and, and give really constructive feedback. So we have a, a group which we call Protect Our Parks group. And, and again, it's, it's mostly retired professional people. Um, in fact, I think it's all retired professional people. And, and we, we have the capacity to actually read and uh, critique. And I think that that is something that's, that's um, we really feel that we contribute um, to our local community. Um, one of the things, uh, oh, perhaps uh, another final example of, of uh, how I uh, think I contribute to uh, local digital things. Oh, no, I won't do that one. That's old hat. My husband's telling me to say things and I'm telling him that. No. offering instruction. <laughs> we, we have a very um, in, uh, interactive relationship. Um, every, every Wednesday, so I've just done it before we uh, came online here, uh, the main news, one of the main newspapers in Melbourne, The Age, sends me an email and about a thousand other people and we comment on three questions. Um, and the responses to those questions are used to form editorial policy. Now, the fact that uh, obviously um, I do it 52 weeks a year that you get and you can have the opportunity to actually contribute your views. So you answer the questions and then you can write, and I write maybe a few paragraphs um, to inform uh, a major newspaper um, of what people think about key issues. And the issues are local, international, um, the works. And I think that's, that, sustain, that capacity to give sustained and hopefully reasoned feedback is useful. The final example I'll give, uh, how many more minutes have I got, Doug? A few? You're doing, you're doing fine. Yeah, okay, good. Right. Well, I want, okay. Well, one of the things that I said that both David and I 
he's super, super fit. I'm okay fit. Um, and one of the things that I, I've decided that I ought to do is, is get involved in medical clinical trials um, because I am fit um, and, and I don't have any health conditions and so on. So I've now done three clinical trials. Um, the most interesting of which is one about osteoporosis. Now I don't have osteoporosis, and so I've been part of a trial that looks at whether potassium bicarbonate is likely to be um, a, a good preventative for osteoporosis in aging women. Am I allowed to say aging? Or do we say elderly or aging mature or whatever? Um, us oldies. And, uh, and that's been really interesting because it, it's not a medical uh, clinical trial for a medical condition that I have. It's an opportunity for me to get involved in contributing to the community by simply offering my body. So blood and tissue and taking supplements. And, uh, and for a while we had to do a food diary. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever done a food diary, but do you know how invasive it is to record every single morsel of food or drink that goes into your body? Um, and that we've had to do for several days. So the kitchen bench has scales on it. I can't even have, you know, so I know exactly um, everything that I eat during those times. Now, that I think um, the, the discipline of maintaining these sorts of uh, rigors um, is something that I think I wouldn't have been able to do if I hadn't had all of the sustained research experience over the decades that I've had. Um, so, so while the examples I'm giving are very much about things that we do here in Melbourne, it, I'm, I'm constantly reminded that the privilege of having had a very broad and diverse academic background has enabled both of us to um, you know, build up a life here because we, you know, as I said, I've lived most of my life, well, not most of it, but um, a fair chunk of it outside Australia to actually build and work with the community here to um, hopefully, uh, well, we certainly have fun, but hopefully be able to contribute um, to others locally. I'm now going to... Um, well, does anyone want to ask questions or, or do we just go on and then we ask questions at the end? Doug, what do you want? Well, unless anybody has any really burning ones, I'd say let's just kind of wait at the end. And okay. I, mean, I know right, we're going to have a lot of variety in our discussions and there we'll, 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 have, we'll have fun. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I'm going to now then hand over to David, who's the other half of this um in our view, interesting um, partnership. Yeah. Hi, folks. I think uh, Carmel's covered a lot of the territory about our background, so I won't reiterate. Um, other than that, to say that um, we have often focused on similar sorts of things because we think we can bring, as former researchers, we can bring some level of rigor to some of the things we do, particularly in terms of writing. My own background is we have worked in a group called the Lighter Footprints, which is an environmental group that we joined some years ago to help um, spread, well, actually to help look at the level of misinformation. I think one of the things we brought to the table was uh, the rigor we experienced in academia and research and therefore being able to sift through uh, quite often conflicting information that people are being fed via the news outlets and combine that with some rigorous reading of actual real scientific data to make presentations and um, articulate you know, basically detectors of, of uh, a very co common Australian expression of BS. Uh, I'm sure most people don't need it. A translation of that one because one of the things that we found in working in lighter footprints is that um, it's really difficult for people without technical training or, or research training to 
analyze and articulate what's important and what may not be important. Uh, there's a great deal of passion, but sometimes information is missing. And this particular group does quite a good job. So one of the things that we contributed in, um, not super significant because it's been going on for a long time, is the, the logging of native forests in Australia. Australia has, I'm sad to say, an appalling record of chopping down our native forests, which are some of the, the temperate rainforests are some of the oldest on the planet. And we seem to be, as a species, intent of, in removing them. And anything we can do it to contribute to uh, the overturning of those sorts of things, we consider to be quite reasonable. And so we recently contributed to uh, some activities to try and um, prevent and remove and end what's called native forest logging in, in Victoria. And this, this was uh, what my favorite American expression by Doug is a, a no brainer. We had a, an economic situation which was both in, was just crazy. Um, the, the forestry groups were being paid out of the taxpayer up to, I think the losses they were making over, over multi-year periods were up to $80 million of taxpayers' money to continue cutting the trees down, as well as causing massive environmental problems and, and water problems and being able to contribute to that. And also the, the, re the retention of some of the Australia's unique wildlife. So we... Yes, explain how you do citizen science. Uh, yeah, okay. So one of the things we contributed to was citizen science. And what the group had been working on for a number of years, we have this rather cute marsupial called, um, called a great glider. And it's a very bare looking thing, very fluffy, has an enormously long tail for its body length. And it basically glides from tree to tree. And working with this group, we discovered that because they're an endangered species and considered at great risk, if you can prove that a tree houses a greater glider, um, then you can get, create a buffer zone around that tree so that the, the loggers couldn't get in and log the tree. Now, the process for doing that was quite specific in that you had to take photos with a geolocation device um, of, the, of the tree and the greater glider. You had to take videos which captured the glider, the tree, and the geolocation specifically, and you had to upload all of that data to a, an online database in, in the government website. And that, by doing that and repeating that over time, you could actually cut off those areas of forest from being logged because the if you find enough greater gliders in a forest, um, then you end up with a situation where the overlap is so great that they simply can't go in and log the forest. Um, and the reason that was done was, and younger folks than us did some of the really hard work, is that the forestry groups who were supposed to be tasked with looking after the forest, they were doing their surveying from the dirt roads running around the perimeter, uh, saying that it was impossible to walk through these forests. So by contributing to that and finding all these greater gliders, it was part of the, the process of getting rid of, of what really was an economically disastrous activity of cutting down the native, native forests. Um, the other thing that I contributed to, uh, I have a degree in, in chemistry, and besides working as a director of teaching and learning, I, I, I've got a reasonably technical mind, was contributing to renewable energy solutions. Initially as a selfish, from my part, is that we try and make our own home an example of of a very high efficiency home with a very good energy rating, but also contributing to the discussions and the activities of the Lighter Footprints Group. And what we've been, what I've been able to do in particular is, is contribute to the East Side of News that Carmel mentioned, whereby you can take what often is very technical information, but bring those skills of academic writing to, to, to understand the audience and then to write in ways that that allow people without a strong technical background to read this kind of information and understand it somewhat more fully. And that's something we, we, continue, we will continue to do in terms of, of contributing to our local community. Um, 
And the last one. Oh, now the folks no, are no, taking no, no, over no. here. <laughs> folks, I want you all to have a round of applause. My man who is, um, well, he's 70. I'm 70. <laughs> he got a black belt in karate last weekend. So hey, uh, yeah, which, which really is extraordinary. I'm uh, very proud. Of so, in, in contributing to the, to the community, um, I've always had an interest in, in martial arts for the fitness, the discipline, and the knowledge. And I found a way to come back after I retired. Um, I thought, well, you know, do I have anything to contribute to a community? And one of the things I think we miss out on as, as academics is we don't we work within our own our own groups. And going back to the martial arts and my old dojo, besides it's a lot more interesting than going to the gym, I have to say. Um, it keeps you honest in terms of being fit. But also I work with kids uh, from the age of about, believe it or not, we've got one four-year-old who's really who comes with a mum. And I am by far and away the oldest in the, in the group. And when you listen on, you read online and you listen to a lot of the reports about the mental wellness of young people, I think that as older, more experienced people, we can bring that sense of maturity into those disciplined environments. And so I spent the last three years um, trying to get my skills back. Um, and, and keep the body in one piece while doing it, but also working with kids and young adults to teach them respect and discipline within a martial arts environment. And Carl was correct. Last Saturday, I finally was successful in getting my first Dan uh, at a black belt um, in karate. Um, after many years of, of having work, you know, that miserable thing called work, <laughs> get in the way and, and prevent us from doing that. Now, I would encourage anybody with the opportunity, not that's just through school, but to find ways to interact with young people, because I think we actually have a lot to offer in terms of our experience. And young kids are so caught up in the social aspects of their lives now, bringing them help, having a person in their presence to have some sort of degree of, of certainty or at least a degree of, of, of knowledge in their presence and in a, in a trusting environment, I think is something we should all look at because I don't recall many environments where there was such a diversity of ages uh, in, a, in a single room where each age respects each other. And I'm reminded of the Chinese concept of Sifu, which basically means teacher. And in Western culture, one of the things I've noticed is that, is that the teacher is always older, pretty much. I don't know whether it's like in other cultures, but that's my experience. But the Chinese one, I think, is quite useful because Sifu means the expert, the teacher, but it doesn't specify age. And quite often, having an environment where young people and older people can work together to improve uh, not just physical skills, but the mental discipline that goes with a, a proper martial art, I think can be quite helpful. And I'd be happy to um, answer any questions about that, but I'll, I'll leave it there for the next speaker. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, Helen. Yep. Okay, so I'm on. Um, okay, so um, I was just thinking how much of my ordinary uh, or initial um, story I would mention, but a, th a couple of important things. Um, <laughs> so my, my background, I was um, started off in, in physics um, in the days, uh, I think I saw my first computer when I was uh, an undergrad at New South Wales University. So I'm now in Wollongong, which is just south of Sydney, and um, that's where I grew up. Uh, then, um, so uh, I remember in third year, we learned about these things called transistors um, and sort of they I followed them through the uh, their morphing throughout the last several decades. 
Um, my um, so I ended up at uh, because of having to raise a family and work part time for some of that. Um, I actually ended up in the Faculty of Commerce at the University of Wollongong, which is the last place I would have expected my my expertise to be used. Um, but they were wanting people who could program. Um, most of us in those days were self-taught, but they wanted someone who could um, teach programming and database design, that sort of thing. Um, I en ended up teaching COBOL, which um, uh, and a number of other, other languages. Uh, and then we needed um, some research interests. And I think Henry remembers some of this, that um, we were very interested in the human side of technology as, as it sort of went out into the into the community. Um, I think in the 80s or so, we had personal computers um, and gradually, you know, everybody has a phone and, and uh, so on. So that sort of um, spread of the technology out into the, um, into the, public arena and and uh, looking at use. So we looked at a thing called usability, human com human factors or human computer interaction, um, knowledge management, um, and sort of information systems sort of as an umbrella after that. So a bit like Doug, um, that's sort of where I eventually found my home. Um, so uh, I was right into this. I did, did a PhD on the use of executive information systems, which um, up until uh, the 80s, an executive wouldn't be seen dead with a computer because it was too much like a typewriter that a, um admin assistant would be using and not an executive. But then when these ex these tools, were, um, these multi-dimension databases came around, it's executives started to um, use computers. So the people using computers has changed over the years. So in... Um, uh, 2007, eight, about that time, my husband uh, was diagnosed with dementia and I had to eventually go back from my full t academic teaching research position to a part-time one because I just couldn't leave him and go and teach. I could do everything else. I was well set up with technology. I could still uh, supervise PhD students. I could still do research. I could sort of exist, live quite happily even when... It was really harder to get out and so on. Um, and I became very aware of how isolated I would have been as a person who was getting older, being a carer for, for someone who, who needed a lot of care um, and uh, not being, if, if I hadn't had the technology, known how to use it, I think it was Skype in those days was the most common tool that you'd, you would have used um, your, uh, and everything was get, um, being able to be done um uh, on on the internet uh you know i would have been very lonely very isolated and and couldn't have possibly worked um and so i got very interested in a little bit of research that was being done about how, how older people were or were not using technology and why so when my husband went into care um and then eventually passed away i was then um, freed up to to get back and and do this research so i started looking at how older people were using the technology. Uh, and where I was at the university, they were all into, I don't know whether you, some of you academics remember this sort of push to translate your research into practice that, you know, you weren't just to, to publish papers, but you had to actually put things into practice. Yeah. And um, so I'd started doing research using action research. Um, the aged care facilities wouldn't let me go and interview people and how focus groups and things like that. So we just went to an aged care facility and started helping older people use their technology and observing what happened, which was our sort of research method. Um, and then that became so successful, it tur it's turned into a business. So as I gradually moved out of academia and retired, now I'm now almost full-time managing a business called Living Connected which is um, doing what we found worked with seniors. That is not running a class or taking them into the library and sitting them at uh, desktop machines and trying to teach them how to use those. But they brought their technology along to what we ended up calling drop-in centers. And we'd have a number of um, helpers there, um, volunteers who would sit with them and try and work out what they could use the technology that they had at the time 
learn on their own technology. Um, you know, we had also one lady came in, for example, she said, um, you know, I'm not interested in technology. There's nothing you could show me that would interest me. I said, well, what are you interested in? She said, um, knitting. So we um, got onto, uh, a, onto the internet and Googled knitting patterns. Um, and she started downloading this and then well, she wanted to print them off. So sort of, so we, we've atta um, uh, attacked this sort of challenge of getting more older people to use, te use technology um, through that sort of approach. What is it you want to do? What would make your life better? Um, and we're now getting inundated with all the local libraries who used to run um, uh, classes for older people to try and help them, which were popular at one stage, but nobody comes to those anymore. They just want help with something that um, they're suddenly faced with um, with technology. For example, I had today a lady who had her first smartphone, had no idea what to do with it. So we have to sit down, work out with her, um, you know, explaining to her what she could do, not go, taking it too far, but, um, you know, they were used to a device that was a phone. Um, and, you know, there, there are ways in which you can engage people to use the camera or put an app there that does things. So we're now looking at all sorts of uh, ways of um, improving the lives of older people and technology happens to be one of the best tools they can use to do that. Um, so uh, we started off just doing a few classes around close to where we lived. We spread into a whole area from Wollongong down to Batemans Bay, which is um, a few hours drive. So we've got a network of little centres. And one of the things, again, um, Henry will remember this, that we were very interested in how businesses could um, grow as a virtual business and as a network rather than a hierarchical bureaucracy uh, type thing. So we've got a whole lot of little centres, some of them in community centres. We've got one in an RSL club. Uh, we've got a whole lot in aged care facilities. We've got one in the only NBN, which is our nat national provider of um, the internet in Australia. They've got one um, centre down in Batemans Bay that's a community hub. And they, um, they're they trying to get people to come in and, and they're trying to help people with their technology, which is basically the same as what we're trying to do. Um, and most of anything else this organisation does tries to get as far away from the end user as possible. Um, they just provide the technology. But so we've been, that they learn from us. We get um, a space to work down there with them. We got on really well um, and uh, we're de developing a whole lot of things that are uh, um, things that pe particularly people in some of the remote areas of Australia. Um, Doug was talking about how big Australia and how sparsely populated it is in most of the regions away from the big cities. Yeah. And we're um, going to a big do in Sydney next week um, which is where they're providing some funds for getting um, uh, particularly older people, but people in remote areas to find out how um, they can be helped to make best use of the technology because that's what the internet is really good for, reaching people in anywhere you go. So we're all over the world. Well, trying to reach people all over Australia is a bit of a challenge as well. Um, so we get asked to do all sorts of things. Being a network, we're very flexible. Someone comes up to us and says, look, we want to do this. We say, well, we've never done that before, but what is it you need? Maybe we can. We've got a team of helpers all over the place. Uh, we've got a lot of retired people come and help us, um, and they usually do it in a voluntary capacity. Uh, we've got um, a lot of what we call our young mentors. Uh, so we have a... Um, a lot of university students, particularly the overseas students and school students, and just that intergenerational thing with where they sit down, a young person and a, and a senior. Um, you know, we get some wonderful friendships across those generations. It uh, really works. And then we get a lot of these people in the middle that we actually um, provide um, a, a payment to. Um, so we don't have employees, but they um, are contractors to us. And there, um, a lot of middle-aged people are sort of between uh, 
young people and old people um, who are out of work or who needed something to do. And they often come and work with us. We give them a bit of payment, but they learn skills. And um, tomorrow we're going to have another one of our farewells to one of our um, one of those people who's who's sort of grown with us, who's who's now got a full time job. Um, and that's I, I you know I forgot I've lost count of how many people who've without much confidence but quite good with technology have come and worked with us develop the people skills that they get through um, working with with older people who are very grateful for the assistance. They learn to slow down and uh, celebrate small wins. Uh, so we've got this now. That's We've got all these sort of side effect businesses where what we're doing is helpful for both so the people who work with us and our clients and, and other areas. And I'll just finish with the latest of these. We've been approached by... Um, a local uh, one of the the federal government's uh, health networks. They call them primary health networks. That sort of looks at how health is working in quite a large area. So ours goes from Sydney down to the border uh, between New South Wales and Victoria. If you know your geography, so it's a big area. Um, and they came to us because the government has in Australia has this big problem of um, the health services being um bulging at the seams uh, people can't get uh um meetings uh appointments to see their doctors we have this um, phenomenon called ramping where people call our emergency a number to get an ambulance and they sit all lined up to go into an emergency uh department in a hospital and there are people out there wanting an ambulance and they can't get one um, so what the government has done is to produce a whole lot of online resources, but nobody's using them. So we're now working with all our seniors groups to say, well, um, seniors like to be independent and look after themselves. So here's all these resources online that you could use to uh, telehealth, e-prescriptions. We've got this thing called My Health Record. We've got a, a symptoms checker, all these things that are quite, um, well designed actually and easy to use and we're trying to get older people to use these instead of calling for an ambulance or instead of so trying to manage their resources through the these various um, online resources lots of apps that they can use uh, and it's working really well we've just been inundated with people um, who've come to these and we're sort of making that our specialty so you know a lot of what people think that technology can do for older people is designing some systems that they can use. But this is actually getting them to get the skills to take um, advantage of what's already there um, and uh, understand their health better, enable them to communicate better with health professionals um, and use sort of online resources to take a lot of pressure off our health system, which is an economic problem the government has at the moment. So, um, so we encounter all sorts of things. We're flexible. Um, uh, I, we, I love working as a network. It just enables us to take what resources we've got, find out what the need is, match the two and get things to happen. Some things work, some things don't. But, you know, uh, at the moment, uh, we're a growing organisation that uh, is surviving very well, um, keeping a lot of people busy, uh, getting a lot of um, community uh uh, connections and uh, and intergenerational stuff. So, so it's um you know it's keeping me uh busy and I've got some reason to get up every morning to because I know you know there are things to do and uh, anything could happen that day. It's exciting. Mm. Uh, so basically, that's my story. Great, thanks much, Heinz. Yes, sir. I'm right here. Well, most interesting to hear these uh, these stories from the uh, academics. They're still academics. We all are. You apparently cannot uh, lose that. I've tried very hard to lose it. Uh, I retired in 2013 and promised myself I would have uh, big changes because I loved my job. I was right on the top of the game research-wise. I was getting grants, national competitive grants, and I was going overseas, as you know, Doug, and I was having a great time. Uh, but anyway... I thought that if you do retire, you might as well retire and 
make some positive changes. So zero stress was, or as near as possible to that. That was a big goal. And I was prepared to do all sorts of other things, but I wanted to go on my outback trips and they need many weeks at a time and all, all a bit challenging. So just to give a bit of an idea, can I share a, a map here? So this is a typical, um, is it is it shared coming up? It should be a map of part of Australia. Um, not yet. Ah. That is there something there? There we go. Yep, got it, got it, got it. Okay, so you can see my cursor here is Perth. That's roughly where I am. About, about here is Kalgoorlie. That's the last time you can get fuel. And from that's Perth to Kalgoorlie is 600 kilometres. There's another three or 400 out here. And then basically, oh, sorry, to this point. And then basically all of this distance here, there is no fuel until you get there, uh, with one exception maybe here. So you've, you have to be prepared to do, I don't know, 1, 1,200 kilometres without fuel and uh, 20 litres per 100 and so on and so forth. Anyway, just getting back to where I want to be. How, how do I get back? Stop video, my audio. <clears throat> Somehow this thing seems to have... Um, you should over. be able to just stop sharing. New share, pause share, pause share. Uh, your screen is paused. Stop share. All right, here we go. Okay. There you go. <clears throat> so by and large, I've been able to do those sorts of things. And and so my, my life is not academic in that sense. But I can see that the way I approach these sorts of trips is I'm using my project management skills. So there are essentially three parts. One is the planning. And the map is that you've seen is part of it and figuring out where you can get fuel and da 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 and so on, escape routes and timing and what happens if you have breakdowns and so on and so forth. But another one then is the execution or the doing of the trip. And the third one is the documenting. So I don't really need to explain much more because the documenting gives a fair uh, indication of, of what happens. And some of these things are publicly available and I've provided already a, a link to that it a useful place to have a look is in the Austria forum. Uh, is that available to folks, Doug? I don't uh, know if it is directly or not. Well, well anyway, uh, after this session, maybe there is some follow up, and if people want to yeah. uh, see that, we 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 can we can follow that. When I'm out on these no, trips. When I'm out on these trips, I'll um, I'll prefer to have the nearest people about ten kilometres away up there in the aeroplane. <laughs> I, I just want to be pretty much on my own or with some co-travellers, uh, which are carefully selected. But very often, uh, it, it, doing it on your own is a good thing. Uh, in terms of my life, how did I get into the academic ones? Since other people have mentioned that, so this generally isn't that available. But look. I studied the Bachelor of Science at Monash University. In the second year, there was Numerical Methods and Fortran run by Dr. Fackerel, short back and sides, white lab coat, really thick stick of chalk. <clears throat> and I was bitten by the computing bug, no doubt about it. It was amazing. I loved it. And by and large, uh, having been on a teaching route, I ended up at Caulfield Institute of Technology, which all people in Australia uh, to do with computing would would know very well these days because they were involved in the programmer in training courses, uh, programmers for the Commonwealth Government. So Helen, I, I imagine you would uh, know pretty much about that. And um, and then there was an opportunity to to go to the West Western Australian Institute of Technology. Uh, so it was a new car, new wife, a new house, new job. I thought going to the West for one year at one or two years at most. Look, Perth is such a fantastic place to bring up a family. We we live 30 odd kilometres east of Perth in the hills. We could afford a slightly bigger property. I didn't only marry a woman, I married horses. <laughs> and my kids could come home from school, spend 20 minutes stroking the horses or brushing them and doing stuff with their feet and putting the saddles on and they'd ride off into the bush 
and come back a couple of hours later. It was fantastic. My, I think my kids had a lovely time and so on. But anyway, um, I've been very, very satisfied with my job as an academic and particularly in information systems because as, many, as, as the previous speakers have already mentioned, uh, this is an introduction into many other disciplines. Uh, the, the human computer interface, the human com computer action, so psychology, and the teaching and the learning, as the McNaughts have, have mentioned, and all sorts of things you could pick up. If you want to chase up uh, artificial intelligence, like Doug has mentioned, I mean, in my case, it was automated essay grading project. So that was an early example of uh, artificial intelligence, you know, doing, doing grading essays uh, as good as humans uh, in, the, in the 2000s. So I've had a very fulfilling life, and in retirement, I just love going on these outback trips and maintaining my property in the bush. Uh, these at this time of year, uh, fire is is the biggest preparation, the threat of fire, the the single greatest risk to us. So there's fire mitigation, fire breaks, da 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 da, and so on and so forth. But my empowering tools help me there. I've got a big tractor and a little tractor, and and so on and so forth. So um, the only academic thing that I've really done is do some peer reviewing. And I think the last lecture I gave uh, would have been, or lecture or conference presentation would have been at the BLED conference in 2013, which was BLED 25, if I remember correctly. And do you know, I haven't really missed it. Um, so the only education that I'm doing now is if people read my my trip reports, they're not just diary entries. There's there's all sorts of things in there. Anyway, look, uh, great to hear the uh, uh, the way people are dealing with all this, and I think that uh, we as academics have had such a rich life, lots and lots of skills to to learn, and obviously we've we've become quite confident in dealing with people. And that's what it is. There's very little that you can do on your own. You've got to work work with groups of people and in teams. All right. So our sun hasn't set yet, by the way. Three hour time difference between here and Melbourne. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Heinz. Henry. Right. Um, I come from a very different background because I'm actually not retired yet. So, uh, you're going to sort of uh, thinking about this. Um, it's really uh, a, 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 a narrative about the transition process. Um, but the way that I want to approach it is looking at these very uh, entangled contexts in which I find myself in. Um, so it's, uh, you know, not a linear narrative, let's put it this way. Um, so on a personal level, mentioned before, I've just come back from uh, Canada. I went to Canada because uh, I was welcoming my second Canadian grand uh, grandson and, of course, catching up with the Canadian side of the family. And um, I mentioned this again because this brings into focus a couple of things. The first one is the idea of the work-life balance. Um, in terms of um, that kind of process of transition. Um, so on the one hand, you know, you can take great pleasure in sort of that extended family and we all do that. Um, but there's a practical dimension to this as well as uh, retirement and being grandparents, and that is the appalling state of... Um, uh, child care in the country. We're talking about aged people, but at the other end, it's as bad as in aged care. Um, so we, we need to actually be supportive of our kids, allowing them to um, fully participate in the workforce. And here we've got these contexts of the personal and a much more broader societal context coming into some sort of conflict. And then there is, of course, the some material matters that arise out of this. And that is um, um, 
you know, sort of if you're retired, you're officially out of the formal workforce. So you're in a position to make uh, decisions about your own activities. And a lot of people who've spoken have talked about their own decisions uh, without any constraints of an academic calendar. And uh, importantly, I think also there is the financial dimension to that. And that is uh, coming to the retirement, being baby boomers, being at the university, at least in the Australian context, um, uh, reasonable superannuation. So there is some financial stability that allows us to indulge in this. So um, the my situation in terms of retirement is that I've actually... Uh, uh, moved from a tenured position into a contract position, which is uh, this wonderful device that was thought up of, and I don't know by who, um, of a transition to retirement contract, which basically means that um, I have a contract for three years. Uh, it uh, is part-time at the maximum is 0.8 and it reduces every year for the three years of the contract. Um, the carrot in this is that the university in their generosity uh, actually maintains my um, super contributions at the full full-time rate. So I don't miss out on that part of it. So this is the attraction of it. Um, so from that point of view, um, you know, I've got a foot in both camps. Uh, but that has, and I'll talk about it a bit later, uh, some uh, significant downsides as well. Um, so from a, um, I guess, a disciplinary perspective, um, you know, I'm obviously a qualitative uh, IS researcher. Uh, I've always... Uh, with Helen uh, and other people, but uh, we've really been looking at complex systems through a socio-technical lens. Um, and we've addressed a lot of, uh, together and separately, a lot of really diverse uh, application areas, if you like. Um, so, you know, sort of for myself, I've been involved in immunology through to health, through to defense. And Helen and I have also done quite a bit of work with defense. Um, so usually the typical academic thing of focusing on theory, nothing terribly exceptional about that. But I think for the purpose of this, one, one of the things that perhaps is much more relevant is really thinking about the methodology. Uh, so mainly uh, research is on participants or for participants, but the interesting thing is um, re uh, participatory research with participants. And this presents some really interesting insights. And I think um, Helen certainly alluded to this whole notion of working with people. Um, so um, the interesting thing about that is we are those people that are being researched uh, because we're in that kind of age group. Um, and I find more and more my colleagues uh, who are approaching that retirement age are beginning to change their focus into areas that are relevant for uh, senior citizens, the elderly, the older citizens. Uh, we have a really interesting group led by Sarah Pink and Yolandi Strangers, um, who are essentially ethnographers, and they are really trailblazing uh, in terms of uh, working with the elderly um, trying to understand how they see technology, how they are really wanting to um, <clears throat> um, 
live with the 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 digital in the digital era rather than being told how to do that. Um, one of the things that also comes out about working with people rather than you know treating them as subjects, and this is the project that the Helen's um, uh, 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 Living Connected came out of that I was involved with um, was um, I, I really drew two things out of that that were stayed with me and inform a lot of the sort of activities I'm uh, thinking about. Um, the first one is that the interaction, the research has to be fun. And one of the one of the comments that uh, we put into our paper was that, uh, you know, sort of there was a bunch of people who were interested in learning about something and they were having such fun. Everyone else said, how come they're having such fun and we're not? So that's how it grew. So this was really important. And when you're researching on people, um, you're not going to get that engagement, that level of engagement. And Helen was talking about that example of someone didn't want to know a technology, didn't need it, but then found knitting things. And that's that's the fun bit. Um, and um, that example that Helen used also highlights the idea that it's driven by the people, not by the researchers. So you can see that I'm still having that foot in that research camp. I'm still the academic. Um, my experience at Monash, and I'll stay with Monash because that's where uh, my experience comes from. I don't want to generalize too much, um, is that um, the there is a worrying trend uh, in uh, the technology space and researchers in technology and their absolute obsession with algorithms and the technology itself. Um, at the expense of looking at the implications and the impact and the ethics of that technology and those algorithms. Um, and for me, as a researcher, um, is that um, I see how IS, information systems, can make such a huge contribution to this, uh, and yet um, there is this rhetorical duffing of the hat about these issues, but there's no real engagement with those sort of issues. And that's problematic, I think, uh, in the longer term, um, because uh, what we're going to do is end up with a lot of technology that does a lot of harm, and there's enough debates about generative AI. I don't need to go into that. But the other um, sad thing about this is that there is no funding for having collaborations in which these kind of um, uh, issues are explored. Um, now, um, I'm raising this fairly obviously because, you know, as I move into retirement, I would still like to be uh, remain engaged in some sense uh, in uh, perhaps not the kind of uh, strict um, academic research as such, but certainly in a contributing way. Uh, I'm also the co-chair of the University Ethics Committee, and I, that provides me with a, uh, a lot of insights about the way that um, academic research deals with technology, particularly from applications from uh, my faculty. Um, and I am also running uh, ethics workshops for mandatory ethics workshops for PhD students. And the prevailing mentality is I'm only writing an algorithm. Ethics is irrelevant. Um, and this can, you know, really uh, is a problem uh, within a faculty of IT, which is, um, as Ron knows, the only one 
of its kind in Australia, which covers this extraordinary range or used to cover this extraordinary range of uh, fields within the broad technology field, technology and information fields. Um, so um, uh, Ron was uh, my dean a couple of deans away uh, ago and uh, came in in 2000 at the worst possible time, I think, for IT. Um, but he appreciate the diversity of the fields uh, of Endeavour at, at Monash and really made an effort to draw the synergies between all of those things. And again, as an IS researcher, I think um, the uh, current um, refocusing of the faculty away from that very broad view of technology to a very narrow and technically oriented one is very detrimental. Um, for example, there's only two IS uh, academics. I think we had, well, I do know we have a third one that was appointed earlier this year. So it's um, that input. And why I'm raising this, of course, is that I want to have that input uh, after my retirement. And um, there is uh, uh, a kind of less and less opportunities to have that engagement. Um, so um, the, these cultural changes, I think, uh, at the academic level are also um, somewhat problematic, um, particularly as I move through that pathway. Um, although on the other hand, this pathway can be very productive. And I was talking to my um, previous head of department who's thinking about this and he's um, involved in um, assistive technologies and uh, immersive analytics, which very much focuses on um, disability rather than just the elderly. Um, but both of those areas are very active research areas. And for him, this pathway to retirement is ideal because he can continue the level of engagement that he's interested in. And then we come to the institutional constraints, and these are absolutely uh, terrible. Um, I'm talking out of school here, but uh, Monash HR is often referred to as the Monash Taliban, um, mm -hmm. even by my current dean. Um, they are terrible. Uh, but apart from that, um, you know, sort of, within that, um, it's um, part of the institutional problem of, of, of working part-time and having a foot in both camps, the retirement and the workforce, is that the rest of the institution works on a full-time work agenda. And so you've got meetings that are scheduled on your day off, doesn't work for you, you don't attend those because if you do, where do you make time for it? So effectively being an academic is a full-time job. So there are real um, problems. But I think the other one is that is probably even worse is this idea of becoming invisible when you're a part-timer. And that is um, because people see the lack of commitment um, and this is a strange thing because you're still working, you're still active, but you're not there at the beck and call as uh, supposedly full-time people are. And um, it's not only in academia. Uh, I'll use the example of my wife wrote a paper titled The Case of the Part-Time Detective um, about a... Uh, a woman officer who uh, took the police force, the Victorian police force, to the Equal Opportunities Commission 
because they didn't want to give her uh, part-time um, status during a period of um, uh, for personal reasons. Uh, and there's a long story behind that because uh, male uh, officers were given part-time status unofficially because they were part of the football team and they needed to go to training. Um, but that's by the by. But the interesting thing is she's now a very senior police officer and she's still referred to as the part-time detective. So mm -hmm. it's not only in academia. Um, there are, um, I think, um, I don't know if any of you have had that part-time experience, but I'll uh, just use the uh, example of my wife who retired last year, uh, became an emerita at the university, uh, and the reason for it was simply the uh, administrative load that was being shifted from the university administration onto academics and the amount of uh, work and the barriers to actually doing academic work. So she now continues her work, very probably busier than she was, but she's now, um, uh, interestingly enough, doesn't have to do, spend 30% of her time uh, kind of overcoming the university barriers. But the downside of it is that even though she's an emerita, the university is very happy to bask in her achievements, which are numerous, but she's locked out of all the university systems other than the computer and the library. Um, so, you know, you, you, you've got this kind of weird space and those of you who are who are emeritus and are still linked in with the universities could have your own tales about that. Um, um, but I think, uh, lastly, um, some critical comments about the theme. The, the, the first one I think I'd like to tackle um, is this whole notion of the silver economy. Um, to me, the the whole language around this is really problematic um, because if you look at the word economy, it takes on the connotation of those in that classical uh, economic sense of the word of transactional exchange of goods and services. Um, it's very one dimensional view of value and um, very limited view of social interactions. Um, and a lot of you have already talked about the richness of those interactions. And the problem with focusing on the silver economy is limiting the value of those interactions in ways that can't be measured. And I think that's really problematic. Um, I think, again, coming back to the example of the work that Helen and I did, uh, we looked at, um, you know, writing a paper about that first experience. Uh, and, of course, you know, you write a paper, how do you measure the outcomes? And in the end, we gave away the metrics for well-being because they don't apply in aged care. Uh, and we... Um, we instead opted for a qualitative toolkit, not metrics, uh, that um, looked at um, eight domains qualitatively of well-being. Uh, and, I, and I think there is a beginning recognition that we need to look at the much more complex. Uh, the word silver is also problematic because how do you define that in terms of age brackets, whatever? It's um, also problematic. Um, my visit to my grandson was in no way economically productive. Um, uh, but it was very worthwhile. It was very satisfying 
the only people who actually made a profit was Qantas charging exorbitant fares. Um, so I think we need to be very careful with the words. Uh, we've got words like productive aging, active aging. These are very loaded words. They come from a um, rather normative, I think, uh, economic perspective. And I think we need to be careful when we explore that. Um, let me end, if I can, if I got time. Doug? Sure. Um, a couple of examples of um, kind of active academics or professionals. Um, the first one is from the work that I've done with the military and um, sitting in on what they call military experimentations which are basically kind of um, uh, scenarios which are facilitated um, uh, and uh, very, very well prepared scenarios uh, involving middle ranking officers from all services led by what they call a gray beard. Uh, and that would be an admiral, a vice, air marshal, four-star general, this absolute top rank people who are retired. Now, the interesting thing about the dynamic of uh, observing these scenarios was the respect that these facilitators actually had in that and their ability to push the um, participants who are themselves senior officers um, in a really um, safe environment where they could break the rules. Uh, so that's that's an interesting role for uh, a, a kind of uh, retirement academic. <laughs> The other, the other one was a very similar one, but a little bit less formal in a engineering company where senior engineers after retirement had free run of the place as mentors, free ranging. They could poke their nose into anything and everything and people um, looked uh, and sought them out perhaps uh, and, um, you know, but the important thing was that they were respected and the culture of the place was such that um, they were actually uh, listened to. So the question I'll leave you with is, um, can retired academics take on such roles thinking about culturally, temp temperamentally, or materially from both sides, both the organizations in which you engage, but also from our own way of doing things. So I'll stop there and so sorry for going on. Ah, thank you much. Thank you much. Ron, what do you think? Thanks very much, Doug. Doug, I thought what I'd do is give a little bit of my history. Um, I'd then like to talk about three phases of my retirement so far, and then a little bit about something enduring, which has been going across the three phases, and the phases have been overlapping, and then maybe a couple of reflections that might, um, that might be helpful there. So briefly, history. Um, I graduated from the University of Queensland at the end of 1969 in accounting and economics. And um, the first thing that happened to me when I started working in, in uh, 1970 was I was thrown into a um, uh, like a 16-week uh, uh, course run by the Queensland State Government on uh, programming and systems analysis design project management. So for four years before I went back to study um, uh, for my graduate work, um, I worked as an analyst and a programmer and a project manager. So that was my initial introduction to computer graphics um, then. 
Um, and then I did my graduate work at the University of Minnesota, and here's my relationship with, with Doug here. Um, the, um, I came back and spent a couple of years at ANU, then a large period of time, 25 years at UQ, uh, 10 years at Monash, and then retired from full-time work, uh, did some part-time teaching at the University of Queensland. When I came back to Queensland, some colleagues asked, would I be prepared to do that? And I said, yes, I'd be happy to do that. So I taught a graduate um, uh, unit course in research methods, uh, acted as a mentor to young uh, academics and also um, was a reader on a number of PhD theses as well as finishing the term of my PhD work. Over the last four years, I re fully retired from Queensland at the end of 2019 as well. In the last four years, I've pretty much been on my own. So um, that's the brief history here. So three phases, and uh, as I say, there's some overlap in these phases, but I think they're probably uh, useful ways of presenting what's been happening. When I first um, retired in the end of 2013, I decided to do some volunteer work um, as a, uh, a visitor in an, uh, a nursing home here in Budrum, where I live in, in Queensland. And um, I did that for a couple of reasons. One is I was familiar with nursing homes and I know they're very challenging and virus. My father was in one for a long time and, and I know it's confronting, but you learn a lot from being in nursing homes. And you might say, well, what's that got to do with IT? You know, what would IT do by way of helping you visit in nursing homes? So I think as people who worked in IT and as academics more generally, there's a couple of skills that we learn that I think are really helpful by way of going to, to nursing homes. And I'll refer specifically to IT here. But one is, as a systems analyst, you turn, you're taught to listen, attend to body language, try to develop rapport with people and understand what they're doing. I worked as a consultant auditor in my very early days as well. And one of the things you find is that good auditors, believe it or not, are really good people, skills people, um, because um, you, the, the people you're auditing tell you about problems. You don't discover them. So if you build up rapport, then what happens is people will tell you what's going wrong, and that's what you need to have happen. So in a nursing home, um, challenging environment, um, your ability to deal with individuals in the home, resonance with all kind of issues, physical, social, psychological, being able to listen, develop rapport, often just sit there for periods, not saying anything, but just being present and listening really hard and reflecting on life more generally was a really enriching experience for me. So I think as academics and particularly people who come out of IT, um, we have got some good skills there that we can bring to uh, a volunteer work like that if, if we want to. In um, at the start of COVID, I was banned from the nursing home. You could, I couldn't go in. Um, and uh, since then, for various reasons, I've not been able to go back to my nursing home work. But that's that's a, another story. But um, that was a really good phase um, in my life. I think just uh, learning a lot from people there as well. So um, toward the end of the nursing home phase, um, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine asked me, would I join the board of a not-for-profit foundation um, that was supporting the work of um, an all um, priest and uh, who worked in very disadvantaged areas and internationally. The foundation had been set up a few years previously and it was really struggling to get up and running. And um, he asked me would I join the board and I was appointed to the board and then I was immediately appointed as chair of the board. Now that was um, again an area where I found that um, my IT skills were really helpful to the establishment of the foundation on a, a pretty um, uh, sound footing. There were very few systems in place, IT systems in place. There were a few policies, procedural documents developed. Um, there was little executive administrative structure at the time, and uh, the foundation was floundering in all kinds of ways. The IT skills I, I bought were um, very straightforward skills. So, for example, we, we put in place Salesforce as our donor management system. We tried to improve our web pages. Um, we got a Facebook presence, an uh, Instagram presence. 
um, we started to use uh, Zoom, we started to use Dropbox for sharing of documents. Um, so pretty basic IT, but the foundation, um, and particularly because we were, we were dealing with a group of um, um, older people, some clergy had, did not have that experience. And so um, while I was doing nothing that was particularly outstanding in terms of IT uh, development, using just basic skills, um, and then writing lots of policy documents and procedural documents, trying to get the, the foundation to a stage where if the um, ASEC, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, looked at this or the Australian um, um, ACNC, the uh, Charities Not-for-Profit Commission, looked at this, we would stand up okay. So there's a lot of work there. Um, and uh, I think also the executive work you do as a, a senior academic within within universities, that kind of executive work and you're learning to work with committees and learning to work with others helps you by way of putting that in place. So that I did that for three years. Um, I think my use by date had expired and uh, I, I re uh, retired at the end of three years and my friend then took over as chair of the board and um, the foundation is, is under his leadership is really uh, doing a lot better. So that was phase number Two. Phase number three um, started um, toward the end of last year, 2022. Out of the blue, I got a contact from a, an entrepreneur in Melbourne um, who was wanting to start up a higher education institute, a private higher education institute. And I must admit, my initial reaction was, you've got to be kidding we need another higher education institute like a hole in the head. And I asked him what his, the initial degree would be. And he said, a Bachelor of Accounting. And I said, again, you've got to be kidding. Um, and I don't want to be on academic boards and I don't want to be on, you know, involved in universities anymore. I've had enough. And um, anyway, he's very persuasive. Um, he um, was an interesting fellow, uh, completely passionate about education. He'd worked in higher education within a number of institutions and been very successful made a lot of money in real estate. And so at a relatively young age, he was wanting to fulfill his passion to put a higher education institution in place and to um, to really uh, get up and running, not to make a lot of money, but just really a passion. It's become more important in the context of the Australian government's uh, commitment now to try to increase dramatically the number of places in um, higher education it's not going to occur with the, the public universities or even the private universities we've got. So these higher education institutions, I think, will be really important as we move forward. So uh, I became chair of that board, uh, academic board, and then it was because of that, I was also on the board of directors. Um, now, again, um, because of my accounting background and some of my IT background, because now things like... Um, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, data mining, uh, big data and so forth, influence accounting so much. I found um, that my background in IT and accounting was helpful by way of um, just being able to advise and assist um, with the uh, development of the degree, the courses, the units, the policies and so forth. Um, I work with a a wonderful group of people on the academic board and uh, on the board of directors, they're older people. Um, some of them retired academics. Um, we don't have the great ego fights that you tend to have within academic institutions anymore. We're all past egos. So it's been a, a wonderful experience working with them and watching how this process goes to get accreditation with the Tertiary Education Quality Standards Agency. I've learned a huge amount just by way of what we have to do but in particular, just learning from the wisdom and experience of the other members on the academic board and the, the, the board of directors has been a, just a, a great learning experience. Now, enduring work, um, I've never given up my research and my writing. It just gets harder in old age. Um, when I retired from Monash as dean, I said, you know, my, my saying is, old deans don't die, they just lose their faculties. And unfortunately, my faculties are getting lost very quickly. Um, so I've continued to write um, more recently a relevance to the, the topic um, that you um, uh, referenced tonight. I've been working a lot on the philosophy of artificial intelligence and the questions of whether or not should, um, in particular, robots be afforded uh, moral standing 
uh, can robots have rights? Um, should robots have rights? Um, all the kind of dangers that arise in terms of um, machines and artifacts. And um, it's been um, an interesting experience trying to read the philosophers and understand what on earth they're talking about, make sense of it, um, and then to be able to pause and reflect on that myself and, and um, see if I can get insights and enable me to move forward with some of my own research. Um, a, a frustrating thing about faculties is I find now uh, my short-term memory is a lot weaker. I have to read papers multiple times before I can even remember what's in the papers, make extensive notes and so forth. So maybe um, one good piece um, of um, um, assistance that could be given to old academics is somehow to provide them with the enhanced memory that way. Okay, some reflections. Um, observing um, friends and colleagues around me who weren't academics, um, I can see that um, retirement can be a really challenging time for many people. Um, you can be like Heinz and, and you can go travel, and a lot of people do go travel in their retirement. Um, some people like myself don't like to travel extensively. Um, and the fact you've got your research, your writing, your reading to keep you going and keep an interest is, I think, a wonderful um, 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 thing that you get from an academic life. And, of course, the idea is to try, as, as, as Henry had pointed out, and I, I guess... Uh, Campbell, David, um, Helen had pointed out to try to contribute back by way of the research you're doing. You can probably work on things that are more interesting to you, work on problems that you find harder because you're not so um, compelled to produce research all the time. So um, that's one issue. The second issue is I think it's really important for old academics to move on and get out of the way. Um, one of the things that causes me some dismay um, within um, the universities is that um, some of my really older colleagues are, are just still in the way of everyone else. Now, there's a role you can play within the universities, the institutions, but they're particular kinds of roles. And so, Doug, I think your role in terms of leading the, the institute where you're working is a really good role to play. But by way of still teaching units, still supervising and so forth, I really think that needs to be something that you pass on to younger academics and let them get on with it. So that's it for me, Doug. And again, I'm happy to, I'm very happy to hear the experiences of colleagues here this evening and um, be happy to just participate in any conversation now. Oh, great. Thank you very much. By the way, I'm now the honorary director of my okay. e-health research <laughs> because I've taken, you, I've taken you to heart. And I yeah, yeah, you, what am I doing? Yeah. I'm standing yeah. in the way of a nice, bright young guy who's ready to take it on. Let him rip. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Let him yeah. rip. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I have one question before we kind of open it up. Josie, have, how much of this do you normally hear from the, our European colleagues? Well, to be honest, we are at the beginning of establishing contacts. When you say European colleagues, they are numerous, but we do not know about each other. Hmm. For example, this meeting today is our formal contact with the group of our colleagues in Australia, which is a great contribution for what we would like to learn and and share our experience in the future, not so far future, <laughs> but in, in the following months and years. We are learning that the background in information technology is very relevant to what we discuss today, because it's about the power of technology and understanding what technology can do for us with all warnings that in certain areas we have to be careful about how far technology can go. For example, it was stressed very much several times today how important it is to work with people. 
We are use, using uh, a sentence saying develop with seniors, not for them. Because we're learning that there are so many systems that were designed by people who <laughs> never talked with seniors, but they assume they know. And here we are basically back to 30, 40 years where we used to be. When I started with programming, I, I, I thought that I, I understand so easily what people are doing. But later on, I discovered I, I didn't understand, really. So talking to people. There is one more point. Technology can do a lot for us. Just think of the meeting today. Without technology, we could not do that. We can see faces, we can listen to, we can get ideas. And here comes a question that we are asking ourselves in our network. How can we be better at collaboration? For example, a message was sent during this meeting about how we can get connections, links to what was described today. My question is, how can we be better at linking our websites about what we are doing? Not who we are, but what we do. For example, what Helen was telling us is marvelous. It's about what? we would like to do with seniors in our country, in the neighboring countries, sharing ideas, experimenting, doing something good for ourselves, for our families, for the seniors. We are not good enough at that. And basically, Doc, to your question, we can learn a lot from others. As Ron mentioned, being retired is a wonderful privilege, so you can be free from meetings, from pressures, and you can do what you believe is worth doing. My question to the Australian group, let me put it this way, would be, how could we be better at that? You within Australia, we within Europe, we together with Americans and Canadians, we together. We all have just one internet available to all of us. Now we have the technology to support meetings. It's, it's like a miracle. Before pandemic, we thought, well, may, it will happen sometimes, perhaps in 10 years. It happened in three months. And now people understand, people use, they're familiar with that. Something what we never had before and were afraid to think that <laughs> it will come, but perhaps too late. Now we have it. So the question would be, how can we collaborate, e-collaborate a better way? And let me finish with one example. Here is Peter Glavich with us today. He is the head of our center for retired professors and uh, professors emeriti at the University of Maribor. It took us three years to create the center. After it is created, we understand how valuable it is. We had nowhere to go. Now about 50 members have meeting points, have uh, webinars, seminars, and <laughs> a month ago, a book was published, uh, yeah, a book was published with 26 authors about what the center accomplished in three, three years. The message we are receiving from colleagues at our uni other universities in the country is, how did you make it happen? Well, <laughs> hard to say. Took a lot of time, but it is worth doing. And when we talk, we are isolated, we are not connected. Well, a part of our responsibilities is upon us. Doug, you can help us as the person who is a regular, not guest, but collaborator with the country for 30 years. 
with numerous activities which are labeled Doug Vogel in the country. And ask the professionals in Slovenia, Doug Vogel, they would know. They would perhaps refer to University of Arizona or maybe uh, City University Hong Kong or Ch China nowadays or Australia recently, but Doug Vogel. So Doug, what could, we, what could be done? Well, I've learned a lot through this session, so I need to kind of sit back and reflect on that and think about that because uh, this has been a marvelous learning experience for me uh, in, these, in these two hours from these six wonderful discussants that we've had. So I need to kind of sit back and think about it, but that's, it's, it's a lot of opportunity. You're right, you're right. What other, what other comments or questions do other people have for anybody or anything? Who had their yeah, hand so up? I saw it. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead, Hein. Am I, am I going? Yeah. Uh, so one thing uh, that came up, uh, I think, in my mind, uh, was when um, Helen, I think, was was uh, speaking. Um, she's informed very much by her education career or involvement with education. I hope I'm mentioning the right speaker here. But to me, uh, the word that popped into my mind was relevance. If something is relevant to a student, to a researcher, to a whoever, it doesn't matter, a politician, if it's relevant, they will invest in it. And that's, so So if people would ask me, what is the, in one word, please, what have you learnt about your very long career in teaching, essentially, like 37 years at Curtin University and three years at, at uh, the precursor to Monash University at Caulfield, uh, it's a fairly long time. It's a depth of experience, not a breadth, but in one word, I can say it, it's relevant. If you make it relevant to the learner, then you've got them. And we're all learners all the time. Uh, so, um, uh, Jose, it's uh, it's the it's exactly the same. If you if you can have, as I've put in the chats, uh, if there's something relevant, an issue, an opportunity, a problem, then we can all make creative contributions. I'm uh, so pleased. A little bit astounded, but so pleased that all folks that have contributed. Um, draw from their wonderful experience, information systems or whatever we call it, informatics, information systems. It's a wonderful discipline because it spans so many other disciplines. It could be education. It could be geophysics. It could be uh, one of my PhD yeah. students was a geophysicist. And, and uh, yeah, anyway, relevance. So that's my contribution. Carmel, David? Uh, oh, it's, it's been fascinating um, listening to how other people, um, you see, for us, I don't think we saw retirement as um, something to worry about. Uh, I, I know the pandemic meant that there were abrupt changes to lifestyles, and that's what really prompted us to stop meandering around the world as we were and focus on what we could do here in Melbourne. Um, and so that in one sense made it, made it a phase change, but it, it wasn't really, it, it's just a continuation that, um, uh, you know, we're both originally chemists and there has been discussions in the chemist in the kitchen. Well, what do you reckon that would do to the pH of this recipe we're playing with? You know, it, it, for us, uh, academic thinking, uh, logical problem solving, well, you know, coming back from all of the experience we have is a natural part of our lives. Um, I Having said that, retirement has given us the opportunity to do things that we've been interested in. And I take Ron's point that really old academics should occasionally get out of the way and move on and allow others to... to to shine, if you like, or to grow. Um, and our work in, our, in Southern Africa, in Africa was fantastic because we were absolutely in the, in the position of facilitators, helping uh, master students and PhD students structure and organize and, them, and, academic staff. and academic staff and contributing to uh, some pretty interesting and fine publications, I think, on the nature of teaching and learning 
in the diversity that, that Africa rep represents these days. Um, and so those publications are available uh, to anybody who published them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think one of the opportunities is to go and do some things that that are a little different. But we have not given up our travel. Our health is good. So in fact, we will be we'll be getting on a plane next Tuesday and uh, we'll be in Italy and then followed by Poland and then Hungary and then Brussels and then the UK and then briefly in Germany before we go to Antarctica, where we hope to continue learning about our environment and, um, and you know, engaging with, with some very, very knowledgeable people about what makes our bits of our more remote parts of our planet function. And that for me is a, a very, very interesting uh, way to spend my time is to stay intellectually engaged, to learn some new skills, um, but also to go into areas that I had no time for uh, as an academic because I was a, a director of teaching and learning, I was a, a dean and that kind of stuff. And I, was, I had other responsibilities and I couldn't pursue some of the passions that I would have liked to when I was an academic. And so the, I think the most important for us, thing for us in retirement is to stay engaged in whatever form that might be. Uh, for me, it's you know, unfinished business of finishing my first stand and getting back to a black belt standard. It's the opportunity to go and work with young people to, in a sense, give them a, a sense that the world can operate without their smartphones and without their social connections, that you can engage with respectful behavior. You don't need to be the same age group. I feel that's a very nice contribution I can make to, to, the, to the world that is around me. But uh, as I said, keep learning, keep engaging. I think these are the opportunities for retirement and get out of the way of people who are younger and have careers and families to develop. Um, I will answer the question in the chat in a, a delicate fashion. Um, there was some output uh, that I was asked to collect and take into the university. So um, in the uh, food diary thing, so there was an input measures and there were output measures, and that was also done very scientifically. Okay, um, so uh, no more on and, that and, one. And, and, and the chemistry yeah. background was very useful because in our household, I am the cook, and therefore, um, chemistry, you know, precise measurement was a requirement, and I found that quite straightforward with my academic background. <laughs> Yes, uh, I, yeah, mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think one of the things that was interesting, I, I didn't make this comment before, in, the, in these three clinical trials that I've been involved in, uh, I have made comments about the research design, um, you know, to the principal investigator in, again, as kind of fashion as I could, that, you know, maybe, you know, what you're doing is is this and this, but have you thought about this particular strategy or how are you going to write up these? Um, because doing clinical medical clinical trials in um, which in essentially a case study mode is quite problematic, and teaching people about uh, qualitative narrative research rather than just trying to do number crunching. Is, is really important and, and my experience quite difficult. Um, people want you know something they can put in a table of figures and has a statistical significance. And in reality, um, complex things like whether a, a particular substance will be a prophylactic for a particular condition is, is, is a very difficult thing to, and certainly not prove, but certainly you can indicate. Um, so I do think that a varied background in research has been, um, you know, a contribution that you, you, you make in almost any co a conversation. I and your faces, then 
you know, we keep saying things like, well, let, let's look at what's factual and what might. Uh, I think David talked about misinformation because certainly that seems to be a, a major problem. Now, whether AI is going to enable one to sift things more accurately or not is very much a, a vexed question. Um, so, yeah. Um, my, 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 my we're concern. just having a ball. Yeah, Quite my, frankly, we love the life that we're having right now. My, my concern is that, is that AI is, is trawling everything. There's no quality control in the process, or it doesn't seem to be. Maybe I'm just ill-informed. But, you know, the, the old adage about garbage in and garbage out, I think is still true in this age uh, to a degree. And it gives one concerns that um, the quality, you know, any kind of advancement in these technologies and support for society is, can only be as good as they're working from. And it's a day is basically rubbish. Um, then, then I have some concerns for our future. But I'm I plan to get on doing some of the more interesting things, and hopefully, our various our current voyages, so to speak, um, will be sharing that information in in a, in a way that's useful for our community about about how they might think about their environment and how they might think about the changes that are happening. Because Australia certainly is going to be at the front line. Of many of these changes we are facing probably the hottest summer we're ever likely to have uh, in in history and there and the bushfires have already started uh, around the country which is a great concern and and people have gone straight from from floods within a very very short period to raging bushfires and so climate change is a bond upon us here in australia and any way we can communicate that more effectively uh, with with our friends, with our the groups we interact with, I think is a good thing. Yeah, good points. Well, let me get on quickly to uh, Peter's been had his hand up, and then Helen, and and we yeah. got to go to a close. Here. Thank you very much. I'm Peter Glavich from the University of Maribor. As Jorge said, uh, I'm a head of the uh, Center for uh, Retired Professors. Uh, I'm uh, originally from the chemical engineering department, uh, 83 years old, and I'm still teaching. I have uh, several subjects uh, in our university and also University of uh, the capital of Slovenia, Ljubljana. Uh, I have uh, international projects and national projects, and that is uh, very important what you said. If you want to have a healthy aging, healthy, then you have to be active mentally, physically, intergenerational contacts, and you have to have company uh, to, to, to join with the people, and uh, also, of course, healthy food and so on. But this is very important, and... Uh, we can achieve that only by getting organized. That is very important. Not individuals, as I have seen uh, or heard from you. Uh, you are more or less individuals. You have to be organized. And we have uh, organized this uh, center for retired professors uh, for more than four years ago. And this enabled us to... to make the contacts. Of course, we have Joze with his uh, uh, knowledge and eager to uh, make networks all, all over the Europe and the world. And this is also very important. We have to be joining in the global. Uh, and we are uh, members of the uh, age-friendly university network, if you know know it. Only the uh, University of Queensland is a member from Australia, not the others. Why? I don't know. As you said, Australia is bigger than Europe uh, and uh, you should uh, get organized. And this is, there are 110 universities in this network. And uh, I'm inviting you to, to look at the website and join us. <clears throat> and of course, to do that, you have to be organized in your university, in your city. And that is important. That is difficult, I know, but it is possible. 
Uh, we are also uh, networking with many countries around us. As you see, uh, Alexander is one of the countries which are close uh, near to us. So Slovenia is, you know, bordering Italy, uh, Austria, Hungary, Croatia, and the Adriatic Sea. So we are Alps, uh, Sea, and Pannonic Plain uh, uh, country, which is on the crossroad of this. And uh, in our center, we are working in six uh, working groups. This is very important, you know, because you have to get organized also in the, uh, the center or in the uh, organizational unit. And uh, the most important maybe working uh, group is about e-learning and e-education. Uh, which is, uh, of course, doing a lot of work also locally. We have uh, 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 some sort of guide guidelines for the seniors in our country, which is publish, published in the uh, several regions of, of Slovenia in, 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 in a way that they can get help if they are uh, sick or if something uh, is happening. So they have... Um, some uh, 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 advice how to do it. And the, the second group we have is on about health, but because health is very important for especially for uh, re retired and uh, elder, elderly seniors. And uh, therefore we have made an overview uh, questionnaire and we are working uh, to educate people to how to stay healthy. Then we have, of course, a group on culture and uh, arts, which is also very important. And we are also dealing with history, the, the history of the university also, and so on. And then we have a special group of, on innovative, sustainable, and socially responsible development of our country and the world. And this is very important. We have contacts. Uh, with the <clears throat> two um, uh, academies, Engineering Academy and the Academy for Science and Arts. And we are working uh, uh, professionally. I have to say that they are respecting uh, our, our ideas and even employing people which are working with us. So it is a very good way how you you can um, handle the, the development. Also, the demographic changes uh, which are in front of us. Uh, so the, you know, the, the number or the fraction of uh, elderly of 65 and more is growing and be, will be about one third in a few years. So this is why this silver economy has come out because this is a very large group which is not only economically important, but also politically, our votes for the, uh, for the next election. So we have, have some power, but we have to get organized. And of course, we are very uh, uh, obliged to work in the uh, environmental problems, as you have mentioned. We also had fires last year, and we had floods in this year, uh, causing us a very high uh, uh, cost uh, for for recovery. So we have to work, and this is very important to get uh, closer with the students because they will be suffering in the next uh, decades and and uh, uh, until the 2,100 uh, hundred years uh, 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 from this development. So we have to do much more than it is done now. And of course, we also have um, some sort of um, uh, problems uh, because the university is not respecting the retired professor in the way that they would uh, have available uh, access to the email address. I'm not talking about the uh, professor emeriti, they have this, but the normal retired professor, they cannot have the advantages of connections with the uh, in, in IT, uh, uh, which is available now. So these are some of the problems which we are doing. We are organizing talks with the 
uh, deans and uh, uh, others from different faculties. And uh, that is how we are trying to spread out our ideas. Uh, you can go to the internet page and see uh, what is uh, uh, our center and also our university. Thank you. Yeah, voila, voila. Okay, Helen, That's you get the last words. We're out of time. Okay, very quickly, um, I, I've just got three observations because um, uh, relating to change, because we all know that the technology is <clears throat> changing more and more rapidly and um, uh, older people do have a reputation for being a little bit reluctant to change. So two <clears throat> things. One is uh, right at the beginning, you mentioned that people um, get better, uh, uh, can uh, interact online better if they've first known people face to face. I think that's changing. I think that people now are getting much more used to this environment. And so it's not as big a barrier to um, talk to people that you've never met face to face because the environment is now a more comfortable one for meeting people. So that's one area that changes. Um, a second one is that technology is encouraging these very short um, uh, bites of information rather than the, the what we were talking about, um, analyzing things, looking at the all the evidence and, and um, taking your time about before you say something or make a decision and so on. Um, uh, so that's that. And so we did an experiment um, some usability tests on some pages that we developed for um, uh, for older people. And we thought that you didn't put too much on each page of the website, but they liked it. They liked to be able to slowly read the whole website and get all the information, whereas we showed the same pages to younger people and they would just see the headline and then go on to the next page. So it's this way that time is sort of relevant to the way younger people think and older people and I think that's where you know the two can inform each other a bit um, and then the third one is that um, when uh, you know uh, and even now people talk about STEM and the importance that you know we want more people to do STEM and to to understand the technology we want people with those skills but the one thing I've noticed as people get older um, they are more in uh, uh, able to see the, the um, the human social side of, you know, every project, every everything we do. So I think older people can, and even younger people, we should encourage people who do who are bright in the um, STEM area, the science, technology, uh, engineering, and maths, but also to bring in the non-STEM. Uh, disciplines, sociology, humanity, humanities, and so on, that, you know, the best, uh, the most useful thing is to either have people with but skills in both camps or to have teams of people where you, the different skills are brought together. So yeah, we did work on teams, and one of the most important people on the team who probably got the least praise was the team builder, the, the boundary spanner on the team that could actually allow people from different backgrounds to communicate and so on. So the people deliberately on a team, you have people that can can uh, translate or bring together the the STEM way of looking things with the, the social science way of looking things. And that's what I think IS people are, are, have, have had experience in. And, and uh, we actually call ourselves the social science with the technical skills and the social skills. So... Um, it makes life more interesting and more, uh, but I don't just think trying to um, concentrate on the importance of STEM and get people to do STEM often prohibits people who are maybe not quite as good at the maths and the and the science, but also have the people skills to come in and and uh, and bring those people in and give the uh, the value and and recognition to people that can cross those boundaries. So I'm yeah. going to stop there. All good stuff, and I think with that we better declare victory. We're we're over time, and uh, <laughs> and I know that the session needs to shut off. And so, thank you all for your contributions, and we look forward to future interactions. So, thank you all. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you. Thank good, you night. Good, night. good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>
Ustedes, vos, que me encuentro, que me 